please do some jazz hands for Serena. Um, this talk is by Serena Jolly. She's a user experience designer at VMware. And she has been spending quite a good amount of time with um, technical writers at the Good Docs project. And she designed a user interface for a fictional tool called the Chronologue, which is um, used to showcase and model effective documentation. In her free time, Serena enjoys reading, hiking, and spending time with her husband and two cats. Give it up for Serena. Thanks for the jazz hands, everyone. I'll go ahead and share my screen. Um, so thanks for letting me join today. As Tina said, my name is Serena Jolly. I'm a user experience designer, and I've been helping with a project called The Chronologue as part of the Good Docs community. Um, just for some background on that, it's a fictional telescope that allows users to see and record past events. Um, and the reason that the Good Docs is creating a website and accompanying documentation for this fictional telescope is to showcase best practices for writing documentation and using documentation templates by applying them to a complex product with a few different traits. Um, one being it has virtual and physical components. There's a website to view the recorded events as well as the telescope itself. Um, it's got both an open source community and eventually an enterprise level product. And it has complex concepts like time travel and how it works that would also need to be documented. So I've been working on the project as a designer for the website and a researcher. And this is actually what brought me here and how I heard about Write the Docs in the first place. Um, today I'll be talking about how user research can be helpful for organizing and refining documentation. So I'll be taking about 15 to 20 minutes to present and then leave some time for questions. And we'll also have some uh, places in between for questions as well. For starters, uh, we'll be posting a poll. I'm curious how many of you have, been, have run into situations where you've had to appeal to more than one type of user in your documentation, or if you've been in a situation where you found that users are asking for support even, through, even though their question's already addressed in the docs because they couldn't find it. Um, or maybe you've worked on documentation for a product that makes it a little difficult to find what you're looking for because of the way it's named and organized. So all of these are really common issues that could be helped or resolved through user research. Um, Tina, do you mind posting the link to the poll? Sure. So the poll is, um, let me I, grab I the put link. it in for you. Oh, thank you, Elisa. No worries. Oh, awesome. And do you want me to share the, share my screen again. A few, a few people, I had it queued up and they already responded just so you know. So, so we're already getting some responses. Okay, great. We're getting a lot of responses in. Um, so far, the top one being users are unable to find the right documentation. This is a really common problem that I have seen uh, and that I know Elisa has run into. Um, she works with me at VMware and something that seen previously also appealing to more than one type of user. That's especially common with complex products that maybe have like an admin level and an end user level type of user. Do you want the screen back now? Yeah. Can I steal the screen back? There you go. So um, these are awesome, great results. Um, there's a lot of different types of user research and today we'll be focusing on just a few that are likely to be helpful to you as technical writers. Uh, the ones we're covering today are going to be card sorting for determining navigation, usability testing to test the usability of either your current documentation or maybe a new proposed documentation. And then lastly, contextual inquiry for finding user pain points and gaps in their overall experience. So by the end of today's session, you should have a good idea of when and how to conduct each of these types of research. Let's get started with card sorting. Card sorting exercises can help you to ensure the information architecture of your documentation makes sense to users and that they're able to find what they need quickly and easily. A card sort is usually done by listing each potential action or navigation item into its own card, and then they'll give the cards to participants, they'll take those and sort them into categories. Um, so some benefits, it'll help you build your structure of your documentation, help you to have a good information architecture um, can label navigation items and categories in ways you might not have initially thought of and might help you to decide and prioritize what to put on each page. So there's a couple different ways to run this sort of research. One way is to do an open card sort where participants can categorize the cards and name the categories themselves. 
And the other way is to use existing main navigation as the categories instead. And that's known as a closed card sort. The benefit of the open card sort approach is that labels are common among participants and could be more intuitive to users. And they might also be labels that you wouldn't have thought of yourself. The disadvantage here is that there's a possibility that there won't be common labels among participants. Another thing that you might see happen is that there's more categories than you thought there would be. So uh, maybe you initially had five main navigation items, but um, there's items that don't really fit into any of the five that you had. This would help you to uncover that. A card sort can be done on several different platforms. So if you're running the session virtually, there's several tools you can use like Miro, Trello, or even a Google Jamboard. If you're conducting this in person though, you can use actual cards. If you were conducting this on Miro, it might look something like this. You might have several blank categories and you can see these are all just generically named as category. And then you would have a card for each navigation item. Um, and these are just the sticky notes that are, are pretty common in Euro. I have a template actually linked at the end of this presentation for this. But basically, um, in this scenario, you'd give the link to the participant. They would drag these cards into different groupings that make the most sense to them, whether these categories are pre-named or not. Um, and then if you're doing an open card sort, they would rename the categories at the end. If you were using Trello, for example, you would have these different sort of columns that you name um, or leave it to them to name later. And then on the far left, you'd have an unsorted column where you start with all of your cards. And same sort of deal, participants will grab cards from this unsorted column and add them to each category. And then also an example of in-person, you might use actual index cards or you might use sticky notes and just ask participants to sort them into groups and then tell you what they think each group should be. I also wanted to share a quick testimonial on using card sorting from our very own Elisa Rock, who is leading this meeting. She says, my documentation team at SaltStack knew that the information architecture for our core product wasn't helpful for users. Uh, not only had we received multiple complaints about it, but our own internal evidence indicated that our documentation wasn't very discoverable. To solve this problem, we did a closed card sorting activity with several customer facing sales engineers and professional services employees on Trello. By watching people sort our topics into logical categories and talk through the decision making process with us, we were able to begin thinking more about how customers approached our documentation and how we could better organize it to meet their needs. This is something that um can and has been done by other technical writers to um, just help make things more usable um, once you've finished card sorting with all participants you'll want to synthesize your results and either create or adjust the navigation as needed so um, here i've listed an example of like a spreadsheet where you can synthesize these results and if you look here um, the rows are actually going to be the navigation items or the individual cards, and then the columns are going to be named after the actual categories. So in this case, the numbers represent the number of participants who have sorted this particular card into this particular category. And you can see I'm using um, an example from our research for the Chronolog project. Um, so there were eight users that listed info about the Chronolog project under the about category. Okay, uh, just some things to keep in mind here. As you're running the session, be sure to take good notes, or if you're running it virtually, record the session to take those notes later. Um, another thing is to avoid leading participants to the right answer because there are not any right or wrong answers. For example, if you reacted poorly to a participant's grouping, they might feel that they've grouped things incorrectly, which is not the point. Um, uh, let's go ahead and pause here for a moment. You wanna try and have around 10 to 15 participants for this one. Uh, lastly, I almost missed that one. Uh, let's pause for questions for just a minute about card sorting. Maybe in the meantime, you can... Um, oh yeah, we have a first question. Um, so Serena, how time intensive is this process nominee? That's a great question. I tried to schedule around 30 minutes for this, but when I ran this for the chronolog, I found that it was 10 to 15 minutes every time, uh, pretty consistently. It is not very time intensive. Um, 30 minutes can help you, especially if you have a lot of cards and you want to go through a lot of discussion afterwards. 
Um, but even with discussion, it didn't end up taking too long. <laughs> Perfect. And um, June asks if you normally do this at the beginning of a new project. So when is this an adequate um, solution? That is a great question. So anytime you are either figuring out or evaluating the information architecture of your documentation or a user interface, that's when this would be helpful. So um, if you are just barely starting a new product or a new feature and you need to figure out the navigation and what's going to make the most sense to users, a card sort would be best for that. Um, you might take all of your things that you know you're going to include and have them sort them into categories. Maybe you can even ask what's missing if you're that um, early in the process. On the other hand, um, like in Elisa's case study, you know, she talked about how we already knew that the navigation, the architecture for our documentation at SaltStack was not good, both internal evidence and external evidence. And in that case, you might initially run like usability testing to validate that, but then a card sort would help you to resort that and refigure out that navigation. Um, does that make sense? Yeah, I think it makes sense. Um, June says, uh, thank you. Um, then we have another question from Gayathri and she wants to know, are there any generic categories based on which we perform card sorting? Um, do you mean like generic navigation categories that's recommended? Um, I would, Sorry. yeah, yes, she says yes. There's not, and it really depends on the purpose of your um, site. If this is for documentation, obviously that's going to be geared towards how you have the documentation set up um, and what the subject matter is. If you have like a marketing site, you might have like an about us section, you might have a home page, you might have um, like a main area with specific actions. It really depends on the focus of the product that you're doing technical writing for. Okay. Um, JP had a similar question, so I hope it's okay if I skip this for now. Um, I will take one last question before we move on. Um, and uh, the, the last question I would pick for now is, um, maybe you mentioned this, but is there a sweet spot um, about the number of participants? Yeah, absolutely. So for qualitative research studies, typically you want between five to 10 people. Uh, for card sorts, I've often seen up to 15. So I would, I would recommend somewhere between 10 and 15. Um, researchers have found that after about 15 participants for qualitative studies like this, uh, because the because it's not the point to have it be statistically significant and you're trying to uncover problems and see how people think, um, you hit a point of diminishing returns after 10 to 15 participants. Cool. Thank you so much for the insights so far. Um, so we will share two more um, resources for you, two more ways of conducting root user research. So take it away, Serena. Okay, thanks, Tina. I'm on mute, sorry. The next research method I wanted to talk about is usability testing. Usability testing is done by having participants complete specific tasks to test how intuitive a user interface is, or in this case, your documentation. Um, typically you'd want, as I mentioned, five to 10 participants, and this can be done either virtually or in person. Um, classically, you know, in original usability testing, you would have like a whole room set up with a one-way mirror and people taking notes and observing on the other side of the mirror. Um, but that's not really accessible and doable for the majority of us. Um, and you can actually get a lot of the same results doing things virtually or just one-on-one -on -one together. Uh, the benefit of usability testing for documentation is that you can see how easy or difficult it is to find and understand the most common documentation needs or test documentation for new features. As you're creating a usability test plan, there's a few things that you'll need to keep in mind. Um, it's best if you can partner with someone so that some, one person's moderating while the other person takes notes. It can be helpful to give the tasks to participants both verbally and in writing so that they can refer back to that task if needed. Um, you should be writing your tasks based on the goal of your research. So if you wanted to make sure a specific piece of documentation is findable, 
what you might do is ask how they would go about looking for it and watch where they look first, what they try to click on, and how long it takes them. Um, to that point, you'll want to give a score for each task between zero and two. Zero meaning that they were not able to accomplish the task at all, or they had a really hard time, they you know clicked all around the page before they eventually found it. Um, one being they accomplished the task, task, but maybe it took a little bit or they didn't immediately know how. Um, and two is for when they were able to accomplish the task with no problems at all. Just like with the card sorting, you want to avoid giving hints either verbally or in the tasks. And what this means is that you should also avoid having wording in your tasks that match your navigation um, or like your documentation title, for example. This is so that you know participants aren't just taking context clues from the tasks themselves. If you're trying to find out if they are um, able to find documentation on a specific subject, try to use more generic language instead of your specific documentation terminology, unless it's a specific product term. Um, and, and that's so that you know they you're you're testing whether they can find something on that subject in their real life and not with someone giving them verbal hints. Um, aside from that, be sure to let participants know at the beginning that this is not a test of their ability to accomplish your tasks. It's a test of your documentation. Um, so along with this, Elisa was also kind enough to share her experience with usability testing. She says, back when I taught college level technical writing, I assigned my students to conduct a usability test on the documentation they had written for a previous assignment. On the day the usability test was due, several students came in wide-eyed and amazed. They talked about how conducting the user test had been an incredibly eye-opening and valuable experience. Their perception of their documents had completely changed and they realized all the areas where they needed to improve. At the end of the semester, many students wrote about how this was the most important thing they had learned in the class and they intended to test everything, not just docs, for usability regularly. A big point about usability testing is that you are not the user. So um, to Elisa's point here, um, usability testing helps ensure that not just you as the technical writer that lives and breathes the product, but the people that are using it every day are able to use it. Okay, lastly, just like with card sorting, you're going to want to compile your results. And here I have another um, spreadsheet, but in this one, you're going to have like several different pages, one for each participant. For each participant, you're going to give them their score. And remember this score is based on how quickly and easily they were able to uh, accomplish the task from zero to two. And in the last sheet, you're going to compile it. So you see every participant here at the top in the columns, the total at the end, and totals at the bottom. So you can see the total participant score. This might help you to weed out any outliers. If you had one participant that scored low in all areas, but everyone else scored high, that might tell you something different. But on the other hand, if you're looking at the totals for your tasks, you might look at, again, this is a chronologue, um, version here, but we've got this task for how would you look for events from 200 to 500 years ago? Yeah, it's 300. I think it's 300. It's covered. Um, and this one was a 12. So you can tell that this task was like exceptionally easy to find, while this one only scored a four. So we had what would you expect to see on the map versus the grid view? And almost nobody knew what that meant. And so we took some notes about it. Um, almost every participant was confused by grid view and would expect it to say something like list view, and it was as simple as that. Okay, let's take some questions about usability testing. Yeah, I'm curious what people want to know about that because it's a huge field. Like I say, see Squawknail made another uh, comment about the card sorting. So, yeah, um, but let's focus on usability testing for now. I liked one remark um, that she said about how important it is to not guide the user, because I think for me, it was the hardest. Um, so Cameron has a question and he wanted to know about um, your thoughts on the return on investment. So how much value do you get versus how much effort you have to put in? Yeah, that's a great question. So the return on investment for usability testing can actually be surprisingly high. If you look at, <laughs> I meant to include a slide about companies that did not test their products and did not do enough research. 
and failed and spent millions and millions of dollars doing the wrong thing, it can be very costly to not do enough research. In terms of documentation, you might quantify that based on like a support representative's hours. So if a support representative spends maybe two hours a week and every support representative spends two hours a week answering the same question in support tickets that is easily findable in the documentation, um, then that's pretty easily quantifiable. You might take like the support representative's pay uh, times that by the number of support representatives that are running into this and by the amount of time. Um, and that would tell you exactly how much it's costing you to have not solved that problem. Does that help answer your question? Let's see. I really like your answer. Yeah, he, uh, he also agrees. <laughs> um, I have another question about the usability testing from Christopher. Um, he wants to know if it's meaningful to run usability testing after incorporating discoveries and feedback um, to determine whether the documentation has improved. He, um, he remarks that since it's a small sample size, I'd imagine you probably couldn't call it statistically significant. Exactly. Yes, absolutely. In fact, um, some people will run the initial usability test study if, they're, if you're just doing it to make improvements to an existing product and not to create a whole new one. Um, I, I imagine this is especially relevant in documentation. If you're just improving things as is, then you can basically use this to benchmark where you're at currently and say these are the problems, the insights, and then test it later. Um, so that's absolutely something that's useful, and you're absolutely right. This is not statistically significant. Um, statistically significant, you would want to do more quantitative research, and that can end up being, uh, usually you'd want at least 50 participants for something to be statistically significant. All right, I have another question for you. Um, by June again, um, you said earlier that the completion of tasks is rated on zero to two but your spreadsheet showed some tasks rated as 12. Did the 12 represent something else? And she remarks the spreadsheet was very small on her screen. So maybe you want to okay. zoom yeah, in. Let's, let's zoom in on that a little. I wonder if it will let me. Let me actually, I know this is not <laughs> probably what we had hoped to do. But so this is the, that 12 is actually the total. So you can see these are all zero through two, and then there's totals at the bottom and on the right. So this is the total for all participants. Yeah, and to answer the question, basically um, it's just the sum, so you can easily see what worked well and what didn't. Okay, nice. Um, any other questions before we move on? We have a third um, method that we want to talk about. Um, I don't see anything right now in the chat, but uh, feel free to write questions throughout. We will have a more general Q&A at the end. So if anything comes up, we can still cover it then. All right, then um, have fun <laughs> with okay. the third method. Great. And yeah, we can cover the card sort questions we had earlier that we haven't got to yet at the end as well. Um, the last section is going to be about contextual inquiry. Um, so a running theme with all of these is, is that these are all going to be qualitative research methods. Um, so there's, as I mentioned, quantitative research methods might include like behavior analysis, if you use Google Analytics, uh, if you're using surveys to large amounts of people, but all three of these are going to be um, qualitative research, which, mean, which means you're going to want somewhere between five and 15 participants, and it will not be statistically significant, but you'll find some good discovery insights. Um, so lastly, we're going to talk about contextual inquiries, and a contextual inquiry is done by shadowing a participant, preferably in their environment with them, as they complete the task. As technical writers, this might tell you a few things. This could tell you when in their workday they might need documentation, how they go about finding answers when they do need them, and whether they end up having to open a browser tab or leave to look up something here and there. So the advantages here are that you can see users in their environment, whether that's at work, at home, and when or how they normally interact with your documentation. You can also notice disruptions that you might not otherwise know about, like if they had to leave or do something else halfway through a process, uh, ended up switching context, or if a task just takes so long that they have to do something else while they're waiting. 
And of course, lastly, you can watch them work and ask questions as needed in the moment. The disadvantages are that this can be a little costly and less practical if you have no users nearby or that are willing to let you shadow them. Although you can do this virtually if needed. Um, also, it might be a little bit more difficult to recruit participants and it can be a bit time consuming. Some tips for when you do lead a contextual inquiry is to take as many notes as you possibly can. Again, try to recruit around five to 10 users and ask users if you can just be a fly on the wall and watch them work for a couple of hours. Um, managing the insights for something like this, I didn't have sort of a summary or compilation the way I did with the usability testing because managing insights from completely different users on their process can be a lot more difficult. Um, what you'd want to do to synthesize that is basically go through all of your notes. Maybe you can highlight it and compare to the notes of the other participants to pull insights from it. See where you have some common ground, where something has seemed to be a common issue among all of them, or if something maybe needs a little bit more research. Now that we've gone over a few of these common research methods, you can start to apply these to your own work and documentation. And I'd like to just finish by sharing a list of resources here, and I'll be sure to share this slide deck in the Zoom chat as well. So as the slide says, go for it. Thanks for joining today. Here's the list of resources, and I can also just drop all the links in the chat if that's helpful. And we'll take a few minutes to do some Q&A. Thank you so much, Serena. You did an awesome job. And I uh, hope that everyone here has learned something useful for their own work. Um, I will be monitoring the chat for more questions. I think especially the contextual inquiry um, has left some questions for me, um, but I don't want to like take up the stage for now. Let's um, see what our wonderful community wants to know. All right, well, we're waiting for questions to roll in. Um, thanks again for the presentation and is there anything else you want to share, maybe a personal story when you did contextual inquiry? Because I think this is the most abstract one. Yeah, so contextual inquiry, um, something that as a designer I do a lot is discovery interviews. I might ask someone to show me their process, um, especially if you're trying to start fresh with a new feature or a new product, you might say, hey, I'd really like to see what this process looks for you right now. So um, a way this could work for documentation specialists is you could say, I want to know how you would solve this problem in the moment. Maybe you're watching them work and they say, oh man, I don't remember that module. I'm going to have to look it up. So you say, okay, uh, could you please talk out loud, like think out loud and, and do that while I watch? And they'll show you exactly what their process is like. I've uncovered issues with just usability this way too, where someone, it turned out, had to open up documentation and then another set of documentation and then also just Google resources and copy and paste and also test it. And <laughs> there were like five more steps <laughs> than I thought there were that I would not have known about. Oh yeah. Yeah, and I think you summed it up perfectly. Oftentimes when we as tech writers write documentation, we have envisioned this one process, how it should work, and ideally we document it in a way that it works. But as you know, with software documentation, keeping things up to date can be a challenge. So if things break along the way, um, then people actually have to jump through all this, these hoops. So it definitely makes sense to check in with them and do some user research from time to time. Yeah. Um, oh, we have another question, that's awesome. Um, so Luis has a question. Okay. I have trouble differentiating contextual inquiry versus usability testing. Mm -hmm. There seems to be overlaps, but uh, such as observing. Um, yeah, I think that's the question. Yeah, um, that's a great question. Probably maybe talk okay. about differences as well. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So uh, when you're usability testing, you have written specific tasks that you want them to accomplish. So you might say, um, how would you go about finding this specific thing. And they go and accomplish the task and you rate how it was on a scale of zero to two, right? With a contextual inquiry, you are just watching them work and where they are um, going in that process. This might be quite a bit longer. For usability testing, for example, you'll schedule probably about 30 minutes, but for a contextual inquiry, you'll want 
probably at least an hour because you're just watching them work. You're watching them run into problems naturally, organically, and seeing how they solve those problems. You might see that they get pulled away from their desk because everyone is asking them questions and then they come back to their desk and they've lost context for what they were looking at. Um, so that's the key difference is that contextual in inquiry is primarily observation while usability testing is primarily task-based. Yeah, thanks for the clarification. Um, Gayathri has another question and she wants to know if um, this, I assume, uh, contextual inquiry does yeah. include psychometric analysis based on different age groups. It actually doesn't always. Um, I think that might depend on the type of research and what your goals are. Uh, as you're creating like user personas, sometimes that might include demographics. For example, if you're an e-commerce site, that might include demographics. But um, most of the time you're going to have users from a wide range and um, that's not the kind of thing that you would have as like a prerequisite. Okay, Jack has a cool question. So how much investment goes into the search engine optimization versus organizing the content? I noticed that I leverage Google search more than the native documentation structure because every software documentation is so different. And um, so learning them requires too much effort. So what he normally would do would, um, he would Google something and define this site, the URL he's Googling on, like wikipedia.org, how to make popcorn. So mm -hmm. yeah, the gist of it is um, the investment between search engine optimization and organizing content. Yeah, I, I don't have a ton of experience with SEO specifically, so I don't feel 100% qualified to answer that. Uh, but I would say that it's different focus in different departments. Like you might have a marketing specialist focusing on the SEO and that is important, but the documentation is also important, especially if it's something that has to be accessed in product behind a login. Um, because you might be able to Google search it and find something uh, quicker, but if you can and the documentation is something that you really have to learn well to get up to speed, that is a problem that you might want to solve with some of these methods. It shouldn't be something that users have to learn separately. Right. Yeah, I agree. And I can um, add a point from my own experience. I um, once wrote documentation for situations where people had to use software, but were in an environment that they didn't have access to internet because they were setting up an intranet. So in these type of scenarios, you need to have documentation ready and also in a very findable and structured manner. And um, yeah, Googling is not always an option, unfortunately, but for most people that I see um, joining today, we are probably all working um, in software documentation one way or another. But yeah, feel free to share your own experiences with um, user testing. I've seen some people um, clicking on the smiley as well. So I would suggest let's go into our breakout room so we can further chat.